Uh, let's jump into this. We have a new series that's starting, and I'm going to begin by reading to you the dedication out of this book. This is the Chronicles of Narnia. This is one of the top 15 young adult fiction books uh, in history, according to Time Magazine, at least. You've maybe seen the movies. You maybe grew up reading the books. Maybe it's a book that's new to you, but I think it's going to start to hit the news again because recently Netflix bought the rights uh, to these books. So we'll, we'll see. We're, you're going to read these before they're cool again. So uh, they were written by a guy named C.S. Lewis, who I have said I think is the most influential writer of the 20th century, at least in the Western kind of reach of the world. So the dedication says, to my dear Lucy, I wrote this story for you, but when I began it, I had not realized that girls grow quicker than books. As a result, you are already too old for fairy tales, and by the time it is printed and bound, you will be older still. But someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. You can then take it down from some upper shelf, dust it off, and tell me what you think of it. I shall probably be too deaf to hear and too old to understand a word you say, but I shall still be your affectionate godfather, C.S. Lewis. I read that for a couple of different reasons. One of the reasons is maybe you've noticed that uh, we're going to be doing these books for our summer reading series that will be in August. So it's still a couple months out. But I guess my hope is, is that a lot of you will take these books and read them over the summer to kind of get ready for that series. Of course, I won't be preaching the Chronicles of Narnia. We'll be teaching out of the Bible, but we'll be using these books uh, to illustrate some of the deep truths of the Bible. And I, I read this quote in part because sometimes we can approach young adult fiction as being childish. But I think what C.S. Lewis is saying here is that there's something about story that, yes, captivates children, but is important for everybody and something that can happen. And especially when these books were written in England, there was kind of a, uh, a group of people, specifically intellectuals, who looked down on children's stories as maybe being a waste of time, right? The good old British work ethic didn't have time for stories. If you watch that new movie out on, uh, well, it's out on Netflix now, but it started in the theaters called Christopher Robin, it kind of makes the same point, right? Like you, you never are too old to read these sorts of stories. And one of the things that I think we've done in our modern day, while we've kind of reopened the idea of story, it's primarily come through movies, right? So the, the Avengers movies are stories that any of us would, uh, would not be embarrassed to say, yeah, I, I watched the latest Endgame movie. And, and I, I heard that like a bunch of these heroes die in that movie, like Superman dies in that movie, right? But he'll probably... He, He'll probably come back to life, I'm, I trust. No, I know that's the wrong universe. That's the DC universe, Marvel universe. They don't always intertwine. Anyway, I'm kidding. I wouldn't give away the end of a movie like that, but Superman dies in every movie, doesn't he? I think. Anyway, beside the point. Like, we, we, have, uh, we have kind of re-embraced the idea of stories through film, but I think we've, we've also... Uh, relegated them to a lower status than they, they deserve. We see them as purely entertainment sometimes, but stories actually have uh, the power to form us and to shape us. Uh, C.S. Lewis would actually use the word, it's like a window into our humanity. So these books will be a window into your humanity, and I hope, like any story, it will help shape you into somebody who is more, I guess, whole or more human. And so whether you're young or old or anywhere in between, I would encourage you to read these or reread these. You know, my dad read these books to me when I was six, probably when I was three. I read them for myself when I was 12. I read them for myself when I was 16. I read them when I was 20. I read them when I was 25. I'm going to be reading them now at 34. And my dad is reading them at close to 60. So I think like I think it would be a disservice to us to look down on these books because they're young adult fiction. And they're, they're rich enough, like the great stories are rich enough that in each rereading, depending on the, the age or the life experience you have, you will draw out more. And if you're a real like, intellectual type, I would say read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, alongside of the Chronicles of Narnia, because he weaves a lot of the statements about truth from mere Christianity into the stories or into the metaphors of these 
books. This series, though, uh, we're not to the Chronicles of Narnia yet, is going to be looking at some of the stories from the Bible. They're familiar stories. We're going to be looking at some of the heroes in particular, and we're going to start with Abraham. Abraham is a really big deal uh, if you are Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. There's like four billion people in the world who would consider themselves children of Abraham. So if you live in the Western world, Abraham is a name that you've probably heard, and maybe you've heard some of the stories about, but the, the New Testament, like this, the, the Jesus part and forward, uh, references Abraham an awful lot. So if you're a Christian, uh, the Bible says you're actually a child of Abraham. So it's worth noting who Abraham is, and as we go, I think we'll, we'll kind of stay in this like Abraham and his immediate children, like Isaac and Jacob and he and Joseph and these guys. Uh, I, I initially was going to try to do all the heroes in the Bible, and I thought, that's too big, so we're going we're to try to keep this narrow. But it, it, these stories are difficult, actually. Like you, you maybe haven't really read these stories since you were a kid, and reopening them as an adult uh, is a challenge because there are things in there you don't remember because there are things in there that don't get told to children. And I don't just mean like, some of the stuff that's PG-13. I mean, like, we, we talk about Abraham and, and we, we know Abraham existed, but what was it about Abraham that had such a great impact on the entire history of the world since? We're going to try to hopefully open up and answer that question today. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Genesis chapter 11. It'll, of course, be up on the screens. And I'm going to start a little before most people would start. I'm going to start in chapter 11, verse 27, where it says, this is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abraham. Well, it's Abram, but he has a name change later. I'm just going to call him Abraham because that's easier. Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. The name of Abram's, Abraham's wife was Sarah, but Sarah was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day, Terah took his son, Abraham, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan. This is actually where Abraham will end up eventually. But they stopped at Haran and settled there. Now the Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. This is really the beginning of the story of Abraham. And in this story is actually the seeds of all the great stories that are being told even today. In fact, in Abraham's story is your story at some level. It is the story of leaving what is known and making friends with the unknown. It is the story of going on a quest to do something that is outside of your experience. It's leaving your family. It's leaving what's familiar. It's embracing something that, that has significance and meaning in the world. And to you, and this is the, the, the story arc of Abraham can be referred to as the hero's journey. And it doesn't matter if you're watching Star Wars or reading Harry Potter or, you know, right down to Kung Fu Panda. These stories kind of have the same cycle. Le you're leaving what is known and familiar. Somebody calls you into something that is significant. And you have these, like, things that happen to you along the way. Now, I said this. I said every one of us is invited into a quest and is on a journey of some time. And it doesn't matter how old or young you are. In fact, one of the things about life with God is that your relationship with God is a dynamic relationship. It is not static. You will not stand still if you are following God. So if you're, if you're 15 or if you're 25 or if you're 35 or older, God is calling you into something, into a place of significance. A lot of times the, 
The, the switches happen at these like changes in the season. So maybe you just had kids. God is calling you into something specific for that time. Maybe your kids have just left the house. God is calling you into something. Maybe you just lost your job. God is calling you into something. Maybe you've become you know, kind of lukewarm about your job. You used to love your job, but your heart just isn't any, in it anymore. Maybe God is trying to get your attention. And maybe it doesn't mean quitting your job because like jobs are good things to have, but maybe it means investing in something outside of your job that has eternal significance. Uh, we're going to play a little game here. We're going to... Uh, this game is played with our fingers. Okay, so I want you to, with your fingers guess what decade Abraham was in. How old was Abraham at the time of this quest, when this quest began? So if he was like 15, that's 1, 25, 35, 45, 55, as we go. Okay, ready? One, you got it? One, two, three. Okay, a lot of you know. He was 70 years old. Like midlife, past midlife, this is this kind of adventure, this kind of risk, this kind of pursuit of God into something new is not just for people in their 20s. We can put a box around what it means to follow Jesus and say, oh yeah, those 20-year-olds, they'll take risks, but I, I'm pretty settled in. You know, I, I've, I've, I've paid off my mortgage and I, I'm ready to retire and I'm just going to play it safe from here on. That's not how life with God works. God is inviting each of us to continue to follow him. So we're going to, uh, again, look at, look at some things that Abraham teaches us about this quest. The first thing is that neither your parents or anybody else can take you where you need to go. I just, in reading this, I found it so interesting that, that Abraham's father, Terah, actually begins a journey toward Canaan, but doesn't isn't able to, for whatever reason, decides not to go the distance. Abraham actually has to go where God is leading him to go. Nobody can make those choices for you. You have to take ownership. You have to take, you know, take your life and make of it what, what you want. And this actually is maybe easier to understand if you think about it in reverse. And this comes through, I'm sure it happens as parents. I'm kind of like, already, you know, wishing I could make decisions for our little girl, Isla. But I see, this, I see this happen with parents. I see this happen when we're helping people who maybe have less money than we do. We, we have an idea of what their journey should be. And sometimes it looks a lot like what our journey is, right? And so we want to help the person. And what gets haywire is when we want something for the person more than they want it for themselves. So you try to drag them to a job interview because you want them to have a better job, but they don't really want the better job, right? You want, you want these things for your children, but they have to want it more than you want it for them, especially as adults. Like, yes, you have to take care of your, your little ones, right? But, but Tara can't actually take Abraham where he needs to go. Abraham needs to make the decision for himself. Number two, leaving or embarking on this quest means leaving your comfort zone. This is the scary part. It means that you will take risks. Here in Genesis 12, this statement, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you, is especially in those days, infused with risk because they didn't have Skype and they didn't have interstates, right? This was probably goodbye to what was familiar, to, to his identity. Abraham was walking away by leaving his family. He was walking away from his inheritance. He was leaving an area that was surrounded by people who knew him and liked him and going to leave for an area where he would be surrounded by enemies. If you keep reading through the story, you find that like, he's putting his life at risk. And so too, like, in following Jesus, there will be risks. To, to stay in your comfort zone, to, to continue to play it safe, to just settle in, seems like safety. 
seems like the way to go. It, but it's, it's just simply, it's not. It's the opposite. You'll, you'll, you'll find yourself bored. More than that, you'll find yourself, like, stagnant. And, and God, God wants to call you out of that place, call you into something new. The, this, is a, this is like, what's the alternative? Like, like the, the alternative to leaving on the quest is, if I can just use the words of the prophet Tyler Durden, we put that up. I see all this potential, and I see us squandering it. An entire generation pumping gas, waiting tables, slaves with white collars. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy stuff we don't need. We're the middle children of history. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'll all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. And we're slowly learning that fact, and we're very, very angry. Like, this is the alternative to the quest. This is, this is the, the safe route. The thing is, is that, I said this, but you, you think it's safe to stay still, but it's actually not safe. And, and it's not so obvious with Abraham, but there's good evidence that his dad uh, worshipped other gods, which is like this, this incredible uh, dead end. Or it's like the god that made the world and rescued Noah and was being passed on from generation to generation. Suddenly, this family abandons this God. The, the Jewish tradition says that Terah was a, Abraham's dad was an idol dealer. The Bible doesn't actually say that, but he does end up settling in a place that is known for worshiping the moon. And he ends up naming some of his descendants after like gods in the moon cult. And so it's likely that uh, Abraham's dad was worshiping idols. So for Abraham to stay in that environment would almost certainly mean that his children and, and his descendants would end up in that same pattern. And so while there was certain kind of external safety in staying where his, his dad had settled, like money and you know, comfort and, and people you knew, the, the risk of staying put was was perilous to his spiritual life, to the thing that God actually had appointed him specifically for, which was to, to be an example of what relationship with God could be. And so I, I just I want to urge you against staying in your comfort zone. And I'm not saying, like, if this is your comfort zone, I'm not asking you to jump off this stage. I'm just asking you to, like, take a step out of your comfort zone. Maybe keep a big foot in your comfort zone, take the big foot out, put the big foot in, take the big foot out, take another step. Like that's, that's growth. And, and it's, it's so much safer to leave your comfort zone with God than to stay in your comfort zone, like without depending on him. And, uh, you know, one, we've been talking about the influence and the impact of stories and how they actually shape us into who we are and how the great stories you can read over and over and over again and the, the, the life experience that you have will bring out different details. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings. Some of you know this. There is a scene in Lord of the Rings where King Theoden, right, this is the horse guy, is being attacked by orcs. They're the bad guys. And uh, he's being urged to go out and meet them on the field. But he, he plays it safe, and what he does is he retreats into this fortress that had never been breached before. Do you know what I'm talking about? Helm's Deep, it's like got a, a giant wall and then it's got another wall inside the wall, right? And it's built into the mountain. So like, this feels like safety. But this enemy is different than any enemy that this country had ever seen and they are able to breach the wall. And what felt like safety becomes this death trap. And so I wanna show you a scene from The Lord of the Rings where where Theoden is called out, where he realizes that he's reached the end and he, what he thought was safety turns out to be death. So let's play the scene. 
so like this is this is the invitation. Like God is doing something new in this church, and I'm not saying like that there are orcs out there, but there is this great significant thing that God is calling us into. And we've actually more recently than maybe it feels like uh, we, we've just passed you know from transition. Like the couple that planted this church 25 years ago retired. What has it been? Uh, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. Seven months ago. And so God is actually calling us into new things. Not to put up the walls and think, well, we'll be safe for another 25 years doing things the way that have been done. Those things weren't wrong things. But I guess the invitation here is for us to draw swords together. And, And your specific mission, your specific quest isn't going to be exactly the same as anybody else in this room. But we have said, like, if, if you consider yourself to be part of this church, we're generally going out and we're, we're, we're going to take risks and we're going out in this direction. And it's okay. Like, it's actually okay if God calls you into a different direction, but we, we have to keep moving. And so, like, Safety is not safe. Playing it, the safest thing we can do is follow where we feel like God is calling us to go. Third thing we learn from the story of Abraham is that Abraham makes a ton of mistakes, actually. So God leads Abraham to the land of Canaan. And it doesn't take long before there's a famine that comes. And so rather than trusting God, Abraham decides he's going to Egypt. And when he gets to Egypt, he thinks, wow, I have a really, I have a hot wife and I'm worried that people are going to want Sarah for themselves. And that feels risky. So he he lies and said, this isn't my wife, this is my sister, Sarah. And it's actually Pharaoh who realizes that Sarah is Abraham's wife and says, hey, you were setting us up to like, do something really wrong here, right? You have this pagan king who, says, who, who, who has a, a higher standard of morality than Abraham, who lies and sets up Pharaoh to commit adultery against Sarah. And, and you'd think, you know, we, we say this thing like, you know, you, you make a mistake once and you learn from your mistake and you grow from it. Abraham does this again with a different king in a different place. And that's, that's actually pretty profound. In fact, when you look at Abraham's life and you think, what did he do that was so great? God says, I will make you a, into a great nation and you're going to be famous. But when you look at Abraham's life, what did he actually bring to the equation? He was willing to leave his family. That was risky. But Abraham was a coward when he went before Pharaoh. He was a coward when he made the same mistake again. It's actually, it's pretty amazing that Abraham doesn't do anything that you would consider heroic, except for at certain times of his life, he follows the voice of God. There are times where he either mishears God's voice or decides that he's not going to follow the voice of God, and then what God does is he speaks to him again and he brings Abraham back on track. But it doesn't matter how many times Abraham falls off the rails, so to speak, God does not leave him. That's the amazing thing about the story of Abraham. Not that Abraham was so great, but that God stuck with him. And so you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to veer off course, and you're going to do things because you hear God wrong, and you're going to do things out of fear, like Abraham did, and you're going to do things for a hundred other reasons that are going to take you off track, and then God will speak to you, and you'll get back on track. I'm going to make mistakes. We as leaders, like the staff here, the the other leaders in this church, we're going to do things that are wrong. We're going to mishear God sometimes. And I just, I trust that God will not leave us. That's the way God is. He says to Abraham, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. So let's talk just briefly about what it means to be blessed. Uh, The first thing 
to notice is that the blessing isn't meant to be hoarded. Okay? Like, you will be blessed so that you can be a blessing. I, uh, I heard Dave Ramsey, who's like a financial guru, his, big, his main line right is stay out of debt. But then once you're out of debt, you can actually build up this wealth. And uh, he says, I heard him say, like at the end, like as you're building wealth, don't think for a minute that that wealth is just for you. It's not for you to hoard. You're, you're, you're building wealth, wealth so that you can give it away and, and I don't know if he uses the word bless or not, but essentially bless other people. And it, it's risky to use that metaphor because you might be thinking, oh, if God blesses me, that means that I'll get rich and that my life will be easy. That is not blessing. Okay, that's good. In fact, when you get to the New Testament, again, the Jesus part and forward, never once is the word blessing associated with material gain. So Abraham actually does end up accumulating a fair amount of wealth, and so do his children. But that's not actually the, the essence of blessing. In fact, when you look at the world stage, when you think about the great nations, Israel was not one of them. They had economic highs and they had economic lows, but they were never the economic superpower. There was Babylon and Nineveh up to the northeast. There were some uh, other more wealthy nations north of them. The best land even in that little strip was on the plains where the Philistines lived. If you don't know what Philistines are, don't worry about it. But, but like that was the best land. And then the, the other economic superpower was Egypt. They, ha- they were between economic superpowers. They're like New Jersey. It's like, you know, you got New York... <laughs> Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. Like people, people drove through Israel to get to, the, to where they wanted to go. Sorry, I know you're, and some of you are from New Jersey. <laughs> so New Jersey's the promised land. No. Uh, like like the, 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 the greatness of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham is not economic and it's not material. The blessing on Abraham is simply this. God is saying you have my favor. And guess what? It's not because you made all these great decisions. Because Abraham made a ton of bad decisions. It's simply out of who God is. To say you are blessed and you are to be a blessing is God saying, I am with you. And I love you. And to be a blessing, like, at its essence, is to broadcast to people in whatever way you can think of God loves you. So to say, I mean, let's just, let's just make this a little less, you know, blessed can sound a little religious. Um, I will love you, God says to Abraham. And I love you so that you can love others. And in fact, at the end there, he says, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. All the families on the earth will be loved through you. See, the story of Abraham doesn't actually end with the death of Abraham. The story of Abraham gets passed on from generation to generation until you get to one of his descendants named Jesus. And that's what this is actually about. The promise that God makes to Abraham, the promise to make him famous, to make him great, is actually about a descendant a thousand years later more than a thousand years later, named Jesus, who will perfectly embody what it looks like to be loved by God and to show God's love. The New Testament tells us that, that like looking at Jesus is as if you are looking at God the Father. Like he loves the way that God loves. Like as God, he, he's a, he is the channel He is the example. He is the touch point. He is the one who reaches out his hand and says to each of you, I will bless you. I will love you so that you can love others. And and what we realize is that it's not actually about us being famous, right? It's about Jesus being famous. That's what we're living for. At, At some fundamental level, that's the quest that each of us is being invited into. That's the eternal significance that God is calling us each into. And your parents can't take you there. And it will be out of your comfort zone. And you will have to take risks. 
But that's the invitation. And that's the good news. So let's pray. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for calling us or inviting us into something of eternal significance. Uh, we don't have to live lives that are dull and boring and safe because we will be safe if we were follow you. Like We will find joy and peace that cannot be offered to us through the material, uh, through, through the, you know, the variety of things that are out there that we chase, like love, money, sex, power. And so I ask that for each person here, you would actually light up something inside of them uh, and, and show them where they can invest. Show them what you're inviting them into specifically. And maybe it's, maybe it's you're reminding them, like, I've called you to love your biological children for this season, so keep doing it. Like, even if the calling is the same, even if the word is the same, keep doing what you're doing. We ask that you would speak to us. And if it's different, give us the courage to follow you. If it's uncomfortable, help us to lean on you and depend on you. We pray this in Jesus' name.